Nuchum Aboim. Welcome to our home, and again, thank you for attending. Um, again, this week, what I'd like to do is continue with our lecture series that we started on a deeper understanding of the tabernacle. Again, this will be the second lecture on that. So this week, again, on my thoughts, I'd like to continue with our virtual tour of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and its furnishings. We ended last week with a description of the Ark. So before I continue with the description of the Ark, I would first like to address the question as to why the tabernacle was also called the Mishkan. Again, the name that was given. In Hebrew, the word Mishkan is connected to both the Hebrew word Shelchein, meaning to dwell, and Mashkan, meaning collateral. It was the one place on earth where God Almighty's presence would be clearly evident in a physical reality. However, it, is also, fun it also functioned as a, a form of collateral. If the children of Israel were to sin grievously, then God Almighty would take his anger out on the wooden stones, so to speak, destroy his house, rather than destroy his nation, Yisrael. You know, one may wonder as to why the Torah began its discussion of the holy objects that resided in the Mishkan with the Ark. The commentaries tell us that it was to teach us that one should set aside a little time each morning before they begin their day, again, for the study of Torah. An interesting fact concerning the Mishkan was that it was never destroyed. That is in contrast to both temples that were, first temple 410 years, second 420. The Hassam Sofer stated that the reason why the Mishkan was never destroyed was because the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, rested not only on the Mishkan itself, but it also rested on the craftsmen, those who built the Mishkan, who were all Jewish. This was not the case with either the first or second temples. The command to build the ark was stated in the plural tense, which was not the case with all the other items such as the menorah or the golden table. In verse 25, it states, by 25.10, excuse me, it states that the also uh, Arvin, and they should make an ark. The Pnei Yosef states that the reason for this fact is as mentioned in Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers. In Ein Kemach, Ein Torah. If there is no flower, then there is no Torah. Meaning that without financial support, Torah cannot survive. So the only way to guarantee the Torah's survival is by developing a partnership of sorts between the Torah scholar and the businessman. This was reflected in the relationship that existed between the two tribes of Yisachar and Zavulun. These two tribes formed a partnership, whereby Zavulun, the tribe that was involved in business, supported financially the tribe of Yisachar. And Yisachar, the Torah scholars, those that were immersed in Torah learning, shared the merit of their Torah learning with Zavulun. So together, they shared both their physical and their spiritual prophets equally. We witness that due to Zvulun's support of Yisachar's Torah learning, that whenever their names are mentioned, more often than not, Zvulun's name is mentioned first. Now, this was the case even though Zvulun was the younger of the two brothers. We see this concept alluded to in the book of Proverbs, where it states, Eitz chayim hi la ba, that, that it, referring to the Torah, is a tree of life for those who support it. You know, this verse does not say for those who study or learn it. Rather, it states, Machazikimba, those that support it. So this concept is also alluded to in the blessing that we recite after eating or drinking anything other than bread, cake, or the seven species that the land of Israel is praised for. It is referred to as the Berei Nefashot, the creator of living beings. This blessing states that Borei Nefashot Rabot V'chesronon, that God created everything, every living being, with their own specific needs, meaning that everyone is born with a chesronon, a deficiency. This one is missing money, and another one is missing Torah. The solution to this dilemma is, Ahakayos Bahem Nefesh Kolchoi, that in order for both of them to survive, they should form a partnership with each other. This one, pardon me, this is one of the reasons uh, the command was stated in the plural tense. Rabbi Eliashev stated that the Ark and the Menorah both symbolized Torah, 
spirituality. That being the case, then, why were they both needed? There are two separate components in the makeup of a Torah scholar. One, private, and the other, public. The Ark is symbolized, actually, the private side, that which exists far from the public eye, serving God Almighty, modestly. The menorah, on the other hand, symbolized the public side, bringing the godly light into this physical world by being what we call a Kiddush Hashem, a positive example for all to see and to emulate. The connection between the Ark and the menorah is alluded to by the spelling of the Hebrew word, Ark, Arun. It's spelled Aleph, Resh, Vav, Nun. The letters Nun and Resh together spell the Hebrew word Ner, which means candle or light. This still leaves over the Vav and the Aleph. The gematria, the numerical value of the letter Vav, is six. The gematria, the numerical value of the letter Aleph, is one. Six plus one, seven. In allusion to the fact that the menorah was constructed with seven branches, which featured, again, seven lights. In addition, these two letters, the Vav and the Aleph, may well allude to the command that the candles of the menorah should be lit each and every day of the week. The Vav, Gematria 6, alludes to the six days of the week, and the Aleph, Gematria 1, comes to include the Shabbat. This Gematria teaches us that the menorah should be lit even on the Shabbat. Now, this fact is unusual, since it is forbidden to kindle a fire on the Shabbat outside the tabernacle. However, in God's house, in the Mishkan, it was not only permitted, it was mandatory, again, based on a base Mordechai. Now, the Kleoker stated that there were two witnesses that testified that the Shekhinah, that the divinity of God, rested permanently in the Mishkan. The two presented visible proof that God Almighty had forgiven the children of Israel for their grievous sin of serving the golden calf. The two witnesses were the Aaron, the ark that housed the Luchot Ha'edus, the tablets of testimony, which miraculously took up no space in the Holy of Holies, and the Ner Ravi, the western light, that burned continuously in the menorah, though all the other lights received the same amount of oil each night. In the morning, six of the flames were no longer burning. However, the seventh light, the, the Ner Ravi, was still burning brightly, and it continued to do so until it was manually extinguished. So both of these were connected with miracles. They both testified that God's holy presence resided permanently in the temple. The Turi Torah states that the total dimensions of the ark were five and one-half cubits. Number five alludes to the five books of the Torah, what we refer to as Torah Shabal, Torah Shabbat Shabbat the written Torah. That number half alludes to the fact that these five books make up only half of the Torah. The other half of the Torah is referred to as Torah Shilbal Peh, the oral Torah. There are different opinions as to whether the Ark was constructed with or without legs, but in either case, the Ark would have rested on the ground. This symbolized that in order for spirituality to be effective in this world, it must be connected to physicality, the earth. As it states that we should strive to connect Torah in Derech Eretz. Torah should be with the physical world. Now, after the description of the Ark, the Torah continues with the command that four golden rings should be attached to the four corners of the Ark. The number four is not random. Our sages tell us that there are four qualities that a Torah scholar must possess which is alluded to by the four golden rings, and they are Torah, mitzvot, good deeds, and humility. The shock states that the four rings allude to the oral Torah and the four ways that it is used to interpret the written Torah. It is referred to as the, with the Hebrew word pardes, which means the garden, spelled pe, reish, dalad, sama. This word is an acronym for the four methods used to uncover the deeper meanings in the Torah. The pay alludes to what is referred to as pshat, simple explanation. The resh alludes to remes, something that is hinted to in the text. The dalit alludes to drush, a homiletical interpretation. And the samak alludes to the mystical approach to Torah, what we call kabbalah. The Torah commanded that the two poles that were used to carry the ark should be made out of acacia wood. 
these poles were to be overlaid with gold and then inserted into the golden rings that were attached to the ark. The Torah commanded that these rings should never be removed from the ark, even when it was stationary, resting in the Holy of Holies. There are several reasons given for this fact. The simplest answer is that it was meant to prevent accidents from occurring. Since in the desert, the nation traveled only by the command of God, which meant that the ark needed to be ready to travel at a moment's notice. And as the saying goes, haste makes waste. Nakshoni states that just like the poles were unnecessary when the ark was stationary, well, so too were they unnecessary when the nation traveled. This was only done as a decree of God. As I mentioned before, miraculously, it was the ark that carried those who held the poles. This is an allusion to the fact that it is not the rich man who supports the Torah scholar. In reality, it is the Torah scholar that supports the rich man. I think that there is an obvious question that we must ask. If a person has dedicated their life to serving God, well, then why would they have to wait to be supported by other people, many of whom are unlearned, rather than directly by God Almighty himself? When a person gives a donation to a Torah scholar, they should realize that they are being given the honor and privilege to be able to contribute to the support of a Torah scholar in his learning. Basically an opportunity to perform a very precious mitzvah. There's a story told of a poor man who came to see a Rebbe. He needed financial assistance. Well, the Rebbe wrote him out a letter and told him to present the letter to one of his rich chassidim. The poor man did as the Rebbe instructed. However, when he presented the letter to the rich chassid, well, the rich man turned him down. He said that he would only give him half of the amount that he needed. The poor man refused to accept anything. And so he returned to the Rebbe and related to him what had occurred. The Rebbe told him not to worry. And he gave him the name of another chassid. And he assured him that the poor, the, he assured the poor man that this chassid would take care of all of his needs. Sure enough, the second individual was more than happy to follow the Rebbe's request. And he gave the poor man all that he needed. Well, it happened that the first chassid had lost all of his money very quickly. So he went to see the Rebbe in hope that the Rebbe would help him in his hour of need. When the chassid approached the Rebbe with his dilemma, the Rebbe told him that he had lost nothing since all the riches that he had held previously were in reality never his in the first place. It belonged to the Rebbe. The Rebbe explained that he allowed a select Jew group of his followers to hold on to his money as long as they followed his instructions. Since this chassid did not follow what the Rebbe had requested, the Rebbe decided to place his money into someone else's hands. In addition, many times God Almighty places a Torah scholar's money in the possession of an unlearned person, creating the possibility that the two should develop a relationship. It is God's desire that the rich man should help support the Torah scholar financially, and that the Torah scholar should help support the rich man and his observance of Torah and mitzvot, a relationship that would benefit both parties equally. I believe that this is the reason that the Torah introduces the making of the rings and the poles before it mentions the ark cover and the kruvim, the childlike figures that rested on the cover. Since the ark and the poles were never separated, this is an allusion to the fact that both the Torah scholar and the rich man share a common mission to serve God Almighty. Though they may do so in different ways, they are both servants of the same master. And this is why they should never, never be separated. The Rebbe, Rebbe Nachum Mandel Schneerson of Blessed Memory, teaches that according to Rashi's opinion, the Keruvim were fashioned in the image of children. We learn a great lesson from this fact. We are told by our sages that the Torah preceded the creation of this world by some 2,000 generations. They state that God Almighty looked into the Torah as a blueprint for the creation of this world. In addition, they tell us that the thought of Am Yisrael, the thought of the nation of Israel, preceded even the Torah itself. We observe that the Keruvim were placed above the Torah, which were represented by the tablets, the Luchot. The two were separated by a cover called the Kaporis, which alludes to the Hebrew word Kapara, forgiveness. So God Almighty's relationship with the children of Israel is that of a loving father and his child, and one that exists even above the Torah. So even though we, we may sin, 
God Almighty is always looking for excuses to forgive us. This is much like the relationship that exists between a father and his very special and beloved child. Rabbeinu Bachai states that from the wording of the verse in the portion of Truma, we learn that the two figures were not identical. One was male and the other was a female. This was an allusion to the fact that God Almighty loves the children of Israel as deeply as the love that exists between a man and a woman. The Isnaim Torah says that the Kruvim were made in the image of children to teach that our children's education must be rooted in Torah and Mitzvot. The fact that the voice of God Almighty in the Mishkan originated from between the two Kruvim teaches us the importance of children learning Torah. Our children are not only our future, they are also connected to our past. You know, the Medrash tells us that before God Almighty offered the Torah to the children of Israel, he asked them for a guarantee that they would keep all the Torah demands of them. In response, they offered their word. <laughs> God sort of chuckled. So then they offered him their lives. Again, he said, that wasn't good enough. However, when they offered him the lives of their children, then God's reply was, that I accept. So seeing that it is the lives of our children that were offered up to God as guarantors of the Torah, it was only proper that the voice of God should emanate from between the childlike figures that rested on the cover of the ark. You know, Rabbeinu Meruvain Margolis states that the Kruvim were placed above the ark to teach us that the education of our children should even precede our own perfection. In addition, the fact that there were two figures that adorned the cover of the ark, not one, can be viewed as a message from God Almighty that Torah should be learned together with a chavrusa, a study partner. Rav Simcha Zissel Mikhelm said that the Torah scholars refer to as a Talmud Chacham, a student of wisdom. But why do we refer to him as a student? We use this title to constantly remind him that he should not feel arrogant. He should always feel like he is only a Talmud, a student, one who is only beginning in the study of his Torah. You know, the Torah commanded that Kruvim should be miksha, beaten. Now, the Hebrew word miksha is connected to the word kosher, meaning hard or difficult. This word may be an allusion to the fact that there were four commands given over to Moshe, which he found difficult to comprehend. The word miksha is an allusion to these four commands. The word is spelled mem, kuf, shin, he which is an acronym for these four concepts. They were Mem, the menorah, Kuf, the concept of korbanot, sacrifices, Shin, Shkolem, the donation of the half shekel, and He, alluding to HaChodesh Hazeh, the making of the Hebrew calendar. What was it that Moshe found so difficult about these four commands? The menorah, with all of its intricate details, had to be beaten out of one solid piece of gold. There are those opinions that state that it was God himself who formed the menorah, not Moshe, due to the difficulty. In regard to the sacrifices, Moshe had felt that Aaron, his brother, had aired his dedication of the Mishkan. Moshe thought that all the sacrifice offered on that day should have been eaten by Aaron and his sons. Aaron correctly decided differently. And Moshe, upon closer reflection, agreed with Aaron's decision. In reference to the notion donation of the half shekel, Moshe found it difficult to understand how money how money could serve as an atonement for a person's soul. Then in regard to sanctifying the new moon, which was the first mitzvah that God Almighty gave to the children of Israel when they left Egypt, Moshe was not certain as to what the appearance of the new moon should look like. So God then, so to speak, pointed to the heavens and showed him a picture is worth a thousand words. There's still more information I'd like to present in reference to the Kruvim, but that will have to wait until our next My Thoughts. Let us end with a prayer for the safe return of all the hostages, the speedy recovery of those, all of those who have been injured. May God Almighty comfort all those who have lost loved ones and may protect all of our brave IDF soldiers and those civilians who are in harm's way. With the coming with Shia Tukainu quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for listening, for attending. Again, God should bless you with health, with safety, and with happiness. Again, please make sure to uh, subscribe, again, push like, and again, if you can share with your friends, it would be appreciated. Again, hopefully they'll find it uh, interesting as well. 
Again, we will continue again with an original song that I've written in a minute. And again, once again, thank you for listening. Shabbat Shalom.